Well, hello again. God bless you all in Jesus' name. This favor rest upon you. Hey, we. And with that being said, we're just going to dive right into the message this morning. And uh, we're going to read from Colossians chapter 4, um, starting in verse 2. So if you have your Bibles or your sermon notes, you can, you can meet me there. Um, and uh, we're going we're gonna to go. Ready, set, go. Verse 2 says, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word, to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Wow. Today, church, I want to talk about what it is to live with godly surveillance in our lives. About 12 years ago, there was a little video put out there on YouTube by a guy by the name of Ed. And now, almost 13 years later, it has over 42 million views. Maybe you've watched it before. It's the, would you look at that video? Anybody? Well, just look at it, right? Now, anybody who's seen it, you know what I'm talking about. Here's this crazy guy that walks up to another guy who's wiping down his car. It's an old 1978 car, nothing special. And, and this guy's walking up, making it like it's the greatest car in the world. And the guy's trying to talk, and all, all, all Ed can do is just say, well, would you look at it? And you just keep, well, just look at it. Just look at this. Look at that. You know, I remember for, for, for that whole year, friends and I, like, we would just get bogged down in conversation just saying, would you look at that? Now, if you haven't seen the video, you think that's weird, and you think I'm weird, and that's okay. All right? But, but it was quite the sensation. But the idea behind it is, is that, that you got to keep your eye on something. And God has called us to a time right now that we've got to keep our eyes attentive in our faith. I'd like to address the heavy topic in the room a little bit here today. Israel. It's kind of taken over the news, the world scene, and all that's going on. There, we're seeing some very eye opening things going on over there. The message today isn't primarily on Israel, although I am going to talk about Israel to a certain degree. But what do we make from it? What are our thoughts regarding what's happening over there? Where are our opinions being shaped from? What does God's word have to say about? All the conflict that is going on over there. Regardless of the current circumstances on this earth, God has clearly given us some directives as to how we are to live. And that's with a godly type of surveillance in our lives. Have you ever been asked to keep an eye on something before? Eh, Maybe it's somebody's house or you're watching uh, somebody's dog or, you know, whatever it might be. There, there, there may, have, may have been a time or two where my wife has asked me to keep an eye on whatever that she was baking in the oven. Why are you laughing already? <laughs> I'll acquiesce to her request. And sometimes there's things, though, that, that might distract me a little bit. And I step away with full intentions on coming back to check on what's in the oven. But maybe a time or two, I've come back just a little bit late. Just a little bit. I think the oven is probably, the, the, the temperature is not right in there, to be honest. But I don't know about you, but I, I enjoy a little bit of crispness in my food. A little charbroiled broil, taste, you know, on the cornbread. Just enhances the flavor, right? Uh, It might be a little darkened and not really too moist, but we need to count our blessings that we even have food, right? Come on, somebody. So when Jenny comes back and I 
put the cornbread under dim lighting with hopes that she won't notice. I start praying and ask for God's favor upon my life and protection. <laughs> Jesus, shield me, and would you blind the eyes of those who war against me? <laughs> Thank you, Lord. But Jenny, she knows this stuff. She spots it right away, and I'm not going to pull the wool over her eyes. So as she's examining, and I see she's not too pleased. She calls me over and says, so what happened to the cornbread? And I'll come over to it and look at it and say, well, would you look at that? Right? <laughs> Just look at it. This is not the days of which we're living that should motivate us to keep our eyes on the times. It's really God's instruction to us that should motivate us to live with the godly surveillance of what's happening in our world. The sons of Issachar, one of the tribes of Israel, was noted as the people in the Bible who understood the signs of the times and what was the best course of action they were to take according to God's discernment in their lives. They discerned what God was doing and when he was doing it and what they were to do in response to that. They kept their eyes on what God was doing in the cultural climate of where they lived. And they did this as an obedience to God, not because the circumstances forced them to, but because they lived with a holy pursuit and desire to follow where God was leading. They, they wanted their discernment to be shaped by God, not the circumstances of the world. And that's two different things. And for us, we have some very clear instruction that we just read from Colossians today from Paul who's saying, hey, even if I'm in prison, I'm, I'm asking for God's vision right now. I'm asking for clarity. We're, we're instructed here to do some things in our lives. And the first one Paul gives us is give yourself to intercession. He says, Stead, be steadfast in prayer. Constantly pray. The word prayer here can actually mean to be a place of prayer. It's the idea that we're living in constant communication with the Father, with heaven. That we're getting our marching orders from up there, not down here. That we're expressing our petitions unto God that we're interceding continually. It's not that we're just doing prayer, it's that we're being a house of prayer. This temple, the Holy Spirit of the Holy Spirit, God has now called us to be the place of prayer. Not just to come to a place of prayer. It's great to corporately meet. Absolutely. But Jesus said, I'm looking for worshipers who worship in spirit and truth. And he says he wants you to be a place of prayer. He wants you to be an intercessor. That we're pleading for God, with God for the need at hand. Intercessory prayer is holding on to the promises that God has spoken and agreeing with his will according to his word and refusing to let go until he moves. When's the last time you prayed until God moved on your behalf? Giving yourself to intercession is, is, is like the Syrophoenician lady whose daughter was demon-possessed. She interrupted Jesus and his boys. They were on a retreat, probably playing some ping pong, having some Dr. Peppers with little um umbrellas, you know, in the cups. You know, they were, they were getting away. They went up north because where they were at, everybody was kind of just surrounding them, bombarding them. Jesus needed a break, and he took his boys away, but... In this moment, this lady shows up. The disciples try to shoo her away to no avail. Jesus kind of said some things that kind of sound a little offensive, right? He didn't acclimate to her request right away. In fact, his response was a little challenging for our ears to hear, but she refused to be denied. She did not act in a belligerent way after Jesus said, kind of, not, not right now. She didn't look at Jesus and give him an attitude. But she kept asking with a humble faith because she knew that Jesus was her daughter's only hope. How easily do you give up in your prayers, my friends? Maybe the answer is not no. Maybe it's just not yet. 
Maybe the answer is something different because we have a tendency to pray our answers to the situation rather than seeking God for his answers. And then we do the Israelite thing where we're freaking out because we're up against the, 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 the Red Sea, <laughs> right? And there's no way out, but to God, God can make highways through water anytime that he wants to. How easily do you give up in your prayers, my friends? Maybe the answer is, is, is coming. Maybe the answer isn't what, God, what you think God's going to give you. Maybe he wants to show you something different. Maybe he's waiting for you to have a faith that actually meets his power, which is great enough to move mountains. Maybe God is waiting for people who care more about interceding in this hour than being entertained in this hour. Man, I know a lot of people who want to be influencers today. I'd like there to be a lot more people to be intercessors. Maybe God's waiting for a response that isn't bathed in the entitlement of this day and this generation and this age and is waiting for a response that says, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. I'm still coming after you, Jesus. Maybe he's waiting for us to believe him beyond our understanding and trust him with our future. Giving yourself to intercession means that you're willing to go back seven times and pray for rain until a little tiny cloud appears off in the distance after three and a half years of drought. Like Elijah the prophet you see, God already promised the rain, but just because Elijah didn't see it in the sky didn't mean that he stopped asking for it. How many times do we go back and pray? Maybe God's calling us to be a people, again, who pray through, not just pray for. And there's a difference. There's a difference of just asking God for requests to praying through and having a burden for something that's godly, will we persevere in our prayer to see God's power or will we give up just before the rain comes? Elijah heard the sound of a mighty rain coming because before you see anything from God, you got to hear what he is saying before you step out and what he's doing. You see, a lot of times we want God to show us something so that we'll believe. God's saying, no, no, no. I want you to seek me until you hear from me, and then I want you to step out on that belief. The battle is first won on your knees before it can be won in the natural. Intercession is a prayer that doesn't give up. It presses through. It endures obstructions, and it overcomes obstacles. Jesus prayed for his disciples in John 17 that his father would not take them out of the world, but that they would protect that he'd be, they'd be protected from the evil one. Intercession is different than prayer in that it stands in the gap for another. Intercession takes on a burden for someone else and pleads with God on their behalf. Intercessory prayer is an expression of love. It's selfless and it's, it's an act of asking God to meet the need of others. You know why, you know, practically why it's such an expression of love? Because if somebody takes the time to pray, to spend some time on their knees in this, this busy world that we live in, they're taking time out of their schedule to intercede on your behalf. That's an act of love. Scripture calls us to, actually I should say Paul urges us that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. What is good and pleasing in the sight of God who desires all people to be saved? That we pray and intercede for all people. All people. That means that we don't just intercede on, 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 on the political party, on, on behalf of the political party that we associate with. Right? I'm not going to find any friends on that one, I know. But just saying. Scripture says it. All people. Right? It, it means that we don't just pray 
for what's going on in Israel with the Jewish people. We also pray for the Palestinians because Jesus died for them as well. Right? You might not like everything that's going on by any means. And I'm not, I'm not making any, any concessions in that, in that way. But God's called us to pray salvation for all people because Jesus' blood is power enough, powerful enough to save even Hamas. Right? Do we believe that? There's a benefit when we pray and intercede in this way, Scripture tells us, that we can have quiet and peaceful lives. Listen, the older that I get, the more I want some quiet and peace in my life. You know what I'm saying? I mean, not only with life, but man, if I can get some quiet and peace up here, that's a good day, right? Wow. God never, 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 never gives us discernment when we walk with him so that we can use it to judge and criticize. He gives it so that we can intercede. This is such a lesson for me because there's been times in my life that, 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 that God has has steered certain things that he's given me some understanding and insight into some different situations that I'm like, God, I don't know what to do with this information. I see it, I understand it, but God, what do you want me to do with it? I don't know. I don't know what you're asking from me because I feel like this pressure now that I, I know and I see it, and do you want me to say something? you want me to do something? you want me to stop? What, what do you want me to do? Well, this is the answer when God gives us discernment. We intercede. We intercede. He's not asking us to do what he's going to do. He's asking us to partner with him by praying for the situation. Some of you in this room are here because somebody interceded on your behalf. And I've got an over 90-year-old grandma that's got prayer journals full of prayer requests just for me. Man, I'll tell you right now, I don't know where I'd be without those prayers in my life. Who's thankful for praying grandmas and moms and, you know, I mean, I'm telling you right now, I'm telling you, the best right there. Who are you interceding for in these days? Who do you have a burden for? What is stopping you from interceding? Is it a wrong view of God? Is it accusations by the enemy that hinder you from, from coming into the throne room? See, and I, 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 can't, I can't ask God those things. Do you know, not know what to intercede for? Scripture gives us clarity. We pray for those who do not know Jesus Christ. The Scripture tells us to pray that the doors, of, 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 uh, the doors would be open for the gospel to go through. Scripture tells us to pray for those who are in need. Pray for those who rule over us. Pray for the nations. What a time it is right now to pray for the nations. I mean, th there's specific Bible texts to, to pray for Israel. This is actually in Psalm 122, starting in verse 6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord, our God, I will seek your good. Scripture tells us to pray specifically for the peace of Jerusalem. Not because we're necessarily just taking sides on an international conflict. Not because of a certain political persuasion. But because God's word tells us to do that. And we're to be people of the book. Can I get an amen for that? Because we're commanded to pray for peace in this specific place. We're commanded to intercede on behalf of the only place on this earth that God says, this is my land. So we intercede. Just a couple days ago, we launched something called 1948 on our socials. And in 1948 was the year that Israel was rebirthed as a nation. And so at 748 or 1948 military hours, 748 p.m. every night, we're going to just release a prayer request that, that, that we can just take a moment. I want to encourage you all to set your, your alarms for 748 every night to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. 
Like I said, if you're following us on, on our socials, you can, you can see specific prayer requests. We're going to have opportunities to, to be supportive to, to different ministries right now that, that are uh, boots on the ground. <clears throat> we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna be the church in this hour. We're going to pray. We're going to pray for, for Israel's peace because nobody wants what's going on over there right now. Except for evil. All right? And our job is to stand in the gap and pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So we encourage you to join us with this, like those requests, share them, but most importantly, pray, intercede. Let's be a church that prays. Because a church that prays together, stays together, grows together, and moves together. Let's be a people who pray at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. Give yourself to intercession. That's the first part of godly surveillance. If we're not interceding and listening uh, to, the, to, the, to the voice of heaven today, we're going to be overcome by this world tomorrow. Next, we're instructed to be watchful with thanksgiving. And you know, that is so contrary to our natural flesh, to our sinful flesh. Because I don't know about you, but I look at things going on in the world all around me, and it doesn't make me too thankful we're seeing things 15 years ago that we, we would have never even dreamed up of. We're seeing today. Those things don't necessarily make me thankful, but the, 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 the scripture's not telling us to be thankful for what's going on. The scripture's saying be thankful for what God can do. And so when we start to come with a, a spirit of gratitude and acknowledging who God is and his ability, to change and transform situations and circumstances, even nations, I'm telling you, God's all about gratitude. The opposite of gratitude is complaining. You know, when we complain, we're taking praise away from God. We're saying, God, you're too small for this. Scripture tells us to magnify the Lord. Listen, there's so much, many of us that, that, that can disdain and criticize rather than give thanksgiving, me included sometimes. Paul's not telling us to be thankful for all that other stuff. He's, he's motivating us beyond to say God is greater than the situation that's surrounding you in that way. There's more that God's calling you to. And we can do that. We can, we, we, can, we can hit that up in our lives that we can say, wow, God, I am going to, I, I'm going to be a person here that is, is willing to intercede. I'm going to be a person that is going to be watchful in my life. And so the second part of this is turn up your vigilance. Turn up your vigilance right now in this day that we live in. Jesus told his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane to watch and to pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. Do you know why we fall into temptation in our lives? It's because we're not praying. It's because our flesh is weak. Our spirit's willing. But you know, you, you, you'll say, yeah, I'm going to come to that prayer event, but then there's plenty of other things that distract you. Or maybe, maybe, maybe you try to set a little bit of time aside to pray, but about three minutes into it, you're, you're trying to wake yourself up, right? We all fall into that. And listen, in life, we fall in the same patterns of thinking, of doing, and of living, all because we're not being vigilant in the hour of which God's called us to. And when we do that, we actually give access to the enemy in our lives because we're being complacent. God's not going to deliver you from something that you've been a willing participant in. It doesn't work like that. He wants you to be vigilant. And vigilance requires you to act, to actively watch for those things that, that, that pull at the affections of your heart. Not long ago, I, I was out on a call uh, with, with, with a deputy, and we, we received a call of a domestic violence incident, and it was kind of a concerning one because um, they, they had, they had uh, guns in, in the home, and so it was kind of a big deal, and so we kind of roll up and uh, assemble all this plan, and here I am in the middle of it, you know, just like, hey guys, 
this is cool. What do you want me to do? I'll just sit here. Thank you. Right? No, I didn't even have a bulletproof vest yet. Man, I'm telling you, I was looking at me rolling up, you know, and it's like, God, you want me? Half the time they were like, yeah, come on with me. And I'm like, okay, you know, da da da, right? But rolling up with them, and, 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 and we have this, this incident, and, and basically, basically, um, I kind of just camp out in, in the car. Well, well, the officers do their thing, and they do an awesome job doing their thing. Um, but I just remember at that moment, God just said, you know, this is such an opportunity, such a visual for you to watch and to pray. And so I was in this police car away from this incident, and I was just watching the surroundings, and I just started to pray. I started to ask God to just settle this situation. Let, let's see resolution. Let's, let's have people calm down. Let, let's walk this through. And, and, and all these different things, I just started to pray. God's shield, God, God just be a guard to, to all of the officers, to those that are involved in this situation. And, and, and the officers thought it was going to take a few hours to resolve this. Well, 15 minutes later, we were rolling out of there. And, and I'm not saying this for me, I'm saying this because of God. God, I believe, supernaturally did some awesome things that day to calm the situation. When we watch and we pray and we put ourselves and we, we, we make ourselves vigilant in the hour. God can use you in whatever situation he puts you in. Come on, somebody. Just like that, vigilance requires action. Doesn't get lulled into sleep. Lulled by what's shiny all around us. The next new thing. When Jesus sent his disciples out to pray for the sick and proclaim the good news of the gospels, guess what? He instructed them this way. He said, behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. Vigilance lives in the crossroads of wisdom and innocence. And we need to live in that place. People who are not gullible, but people who are gentle as well. That we're able to know and discern the setting of what we're placed in so that we have the right answer in the time of need. 1949, an American company released the first commercially available CCTV system. Two years later, in 1951, Kodak <clears throat> introduced, <clears throat> excuse me, it's Brownie portable movie camera. People were amazed at that. We could <clears throat> start capturing life. Today, more than 2.5 trillion images are shared or stored on the internet every year. That's not to mention the billions more photos and videos that we all have in our personal archives. I believe well over 6 billion people now globally have phones that are able to take pictures and videos. Annually, 106 million new surveillance cameras are sold. ATMs that you drive up to, they're, they're, they're cased in, in video recordings. Automatic number plate recognition devices hover over roadways to catch speedsters. We have dash cams, doorbell cams. We've got facial recognition cameras all over the place, not to mention the millions of drones in the skies picking up videos on a daily basis. Is there anybody scared yet? Let's not forget the satellites that are over 1,700 out in space circling the globe that can pinpoint a, a buffalo in, in, out, out, out in the west and zoom in on taking pictures of, of wildlife in that way. Oh my goodness, we are under surveillance, are we not? But here's the thing, that might be the case, but the greater reality is God has us under his surveillance. So no matter what this world tries to do, you walk with God, you walk with Christ, you let your integrity lead your life, you've got nothing to worry about in this day. Because God's eyes are on you. Is, are they not, church? Do you believe that? The reality is, is surveillance is everywhere. What about the Christian surveillance? How are we laying down surveillance in our lives? Are we being vigilant? The next one that, that, that Paul kind of brings us to here is to make the message of your life clear. See, a lot of times we can get confused with how we're living our lives. And the people that are watching us live our lives, they're asking, are you really following Jesus? Because I'm 
seeing you do this. I'm watching you do that. Christ is calling us to live a message that's clear. Even on his stances. Uh, you know, let, let's just take for a moment all that is going on in Israel today. I, I want to just share a little bit of information. And this isn't to make enemies and the people disagree with different things and all that kind of stuff. But you know why? It's because the information from the media is pretty poor. And so I just want to share just a few different things here this morning. We all know that several days ago, the Hamas terrorist group entered into Israel, killed hundreds of Jewish people. Awful, atrocious, terrible, and it was evil. Evil. You know, the name of the war that they called it was the war to defend the Holy Mosque. I just want you to think about that for a moment. It wasn't to free Palestine from its Israeli overlords. It wasn't to, to, um, to, to, to take back land and to, to let Palestine be a nation. That's not what it was. It was to defend the holy mosque. What does that mean? Well, the desire and the purpose of what they want to do is go and take back the Temple Mount. So we hear all these different things on Palestine and all this kind of stuff, but the reality is that's not what it was about. It was a holy war, and they want to take Jerusalem back. And the reality also is, and this has been said for the last 70 years since Israel has been a nation, many of the surrounding countries have verbally said this, we want to wipe Israel off the map. Now, it's hard to have peace with people that don't want to kill you. It's just hard. And so when we hear these different things, we've got to train our ears to hear beyond, is what I'm just trying to say. I'm not saying that, the, that, that I don't want a place for the Palestinian people and, uh, you know, that I have no love. No, that's, that's not what I'm saying at all. I know Palestinians. There, there are Palestinian Christians who love Jesus Christ. I, I, I know Arab Christians that, that I've walked with in Bethlehem. So don't get me wrong when I'm saying these things. This isn't, a, this isn't just a, a, a disagreement. This is good versus evil. And there's certain things that are just evil. And we've got to understand what those things are. Or guess what? Our ignorance of those things, it's going gonna, it's gonna to leave you high and dry. So we've got to be careful. All through the history of Israel, we, we, find, we find the 1967 war. It was a six-day war. All these countries try to come in, take over Israel, wipe them out. God's hand was with Israel. <laughs> they ended the war in six days. 1973, the war of Yom Kippur. We find two nations coming in, trying to attack Israel. Israel. Israel won that. God's hand, the miraculous power of God, amazing things. You, you, can, you can look for yourselves at these things. This isn't, this isn't made up stuff. And, and you, we've, got, we've got to be students of what's taking place because the Bible has a lot to do with Israel. This is a lot to say about Israel. Isaiah 66 asks the question, can a nation... Be born in one day, in one moment. Well, in 1948, May 14th, the Israeli providential government declared themselves to be a nation again after the United Nations approval. One day is a fulfillment of that prophecy. Wow. We find all through Jeremiah, Ezekiel, scriptures talking about all the return of the Jewish people back to the land. We're seeing that all over the place. We're seeing the Jewish people making what they call aliyah, returning to their homeland, becoming a people again. Biblical prophecy is happening right before our eyes, my friends, in our lifetime. And it's going to continue. Joel talks about, talks about how, how God is going to bring all the nations together to the valley of Jehoshaphat to judge them because of what they have and how they have divided up the land of Israel. 
God's all about that. Zechariah 12, it's some of my most comforting verses on Israel. It talks about how God is going to pour out a spirit of mercy and grace upon his Jewish people who once put Jesus on the cross, but they're going to cry out for him. Listen, my prayer is that the Jewish people understand that Jesus is their Messiah. And I believe that there's going to be a, a, a pretty good turning to him in, in, in the days to come. God's not going to force that. God's going to be, but I believe that God is going to send that spirit of grace and mercy. And they're going to realize who Jesus really it was and is. Because scripture talks about that. And we've got to be clear on that. And Paul says, listen, as I'm sharing the gospel, I want my life to be clear. Make your message clear in this day. I'm not talking about being a jerk. I'm not talking about, I'm, don't think because you put something up on social media that that's your message to the world. Because everybody does that. And guess what? All it is is this and that and this and that and this and that. And I, I, I've done that too, so I, I'll throw that at myself. But we have to stand and act upon these things, not just do the convenient thing and throw it up, throw it up, you know, a picture up or something, right? And I do that. <laughs> so I'm preaching to myself. Make your message clear. You have to act upon it. So don't just pray but what can you do in this day and in this hour? Finally, I believe God is calling us to live with urgency. To live with urgency in our lives. I'm not talking about busyness. I'm talking about urgency. Listen, your priorities reveal your urgency in life. Urgency is different than hurry, my friend. Hurry is a life built on busyness, but urgency is a life of intentionally understanding what's at stake. Jesus said, and these are the words that I want to kind of wrap up here. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready for the Son of Man, Jesus, is coming at an hour that you do not expect. During the late medieval times, London had a strange law on the books. At every entrance gate into the city... They were required to have a musician on duty. City gates were often the first place that attackers would try to get through, kind of like border patrol agents. London required the people watching these gates to be musicians. It started in the 1370s. And to the modern mind, musicians and like border patrol agents, they, they don't really seem to match too much. But back then, they were the ideal people that would be able to sound the alarm because they could play a certain beat or they could blow a certain trumpet. They knew what they, weren't do, what they were doing, and they were able to sound the alarm. Not only did they have to play music, they also had to have some sweet sword skills as well. Jesus tells us that we need to stay awake we are the alarm to the world today. We are in the city gates. We are those musicians that need to tell the world that, yes, Jesus is coming. We don't have to be crazy about it. We don't have to be weird about it. He might come later today. He might come tomorrow. It could still be 100 years away. I'm not making any claims but guess what? When more and more things are being fulfilled in Scripture, we've got to take that and look at it for what they are. Again, 
doesn't mean that it's going to happen right now. And I will also say, from Israel's inception, there has been co conflicts and wars all throughout. So I get that as well. But it's different now because Israel's a nation. Okay? And we've got to understand that. And so if we're going to stay awake in this hour, we've got to be careful about our material comforts because they can draw us away from living awake in this world. They lull us to sleep. And we start living for things that don't matter and can't be brought to eternity with us. Not only that, we also, we have to, we have to, I'm trying to, we, we've got to not only, we, we, gotta, we can't isolate ourselves. Let me say this. We can't isolate ourselves from the brokenness of humanity. See, a lot of times we can kind of be like an us versus the world type of thing. No, Jesus came to enter into the mess of the world. He said he came in to engage the world. Guess what? Christ is calling us to be agents of transformation, salt in life that engage the world. So wherever you're in today, don't think that it's futile. Whatever workplace that you feel is hostile, whatever issue or family thing that's going on that's disappointing, all guess what? God is using you to be an agent of change. Be his light in the world around you. God has called us to stay awake in this day, not to fall asleep. He's called us to act. He's called us to pray and to intercede. That's how we lay down godly surveillance in our lives. Because our desire, our hope that Christ calls us to is to see the gospel move forward and more and more people come to know Jesus Christ. More and more people get set free by the power of God. More, pe more people who are dead in their transgresses become alive in Jesus Christ. More and more of those that were lost become found in Jesus. That's why you and I live in this day. We're called to bring the freedom of Christ to the world around us. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Come on, church. Give it up for Jesus in this house. I want to ask you if, you, if you are just willing today to say, you know what? I want to wake up. I'm going to stop putting the snooze, pushing the snooze button, and I'm going to start living awake in the day that God has called me to right now. I just want you to stand to your feet right now. I just want you to lift up your hands to God right now in this place. I just want you to ask God right now, your prayer to God, God, I've been sleeping in this area and that area. You know you know where you've been snoozing. You know where you've been sleeping in late in your life. God, we give ourselves to you right now. We want to be awake Christians. Not sleeping Christians. We want to be people that are vigilant in this hour. That we're sober-minded. That we're not putting ourselves in the place to be devoured by the enemy who goes about like a roaring lion. God, we want to be intercessors in this day. That we have a burden for the heart of God in this world right now. God, we want the message of our lives to be clear that we serve the one true living God, the way, the truth, and the life. And his name is Jesus, and there is no greater name than the name of Jesus Christ. God, we want to be a people that live urgently in this hour. Not busy and hurried and worried and all over the place, but urgent because the days are short. God, give us a burden, give us a passion to be those musicians and gatekeepers on this world. To share 
the good news, not just the alarm bells, the warning signals, but the good news of Jesus Christ. That your love is so great and that you loved us so much that you sent your one and only Son so that we would not perish, but we'd have eternal life. Jesus, let that message be clear in our lives. Wake us up, Lord. Wake us up in this hour, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Come on, give Jesus some praise. Listen, I... But let's, let's enjoy Jesus in this place right now. Can we do that? Can we do that, church? Come on. Can we do that?